from beautiful North Hollywood, California, it's Flashback Tonight, starring Delius. Tonight's guest rocked us in the 90s with his successful band, Sugar Ray. Superstar Mark McGrath is here. <laughs> song from 97, but who's counting? Oh, right? Yeah. Give it up for the band, everybody. Yo. Yeah, man. Perfect. Just a little number one song, but who's counting? You had a few of those number ones. Well, we got nice. really lucky, and so did you, Delius. No, I remember, no, we yeah. just had one. You had a few of them. Well, let, let me recall a moment. Uh, we were on the same record label, Atlantic Records, yes. in the early 90s, and we got signed around 94, 95, and uh, you know, there was a band walking down the hallway. We were told to uh, hide into an office because an important band was coming down the hallway. <laughs> like, oh my God, who's coming down? And all of a sudden, the All For One cats are walking down the hallway with their brand new number one necklaces. Because I believe, I oh, is he wearing it? Is he wearing it? That's the one, okay? And we're walking that going, we're watching that going, Oh my God, dreams do come true. Maybe we could be number one someday, but then we went, oh yeah, you gotta have talent. Oh, There's please. that little caveat. Please. Long story short, year later, Fly went to number one. But yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah. But nicest guys in the world, they were so, always so kind and always uh, lending an ear for advice and just, I mean, what you see is what you get here with Delius and all the guys from All For One. And I wanna say it's just a pleasure being on the road with you and associating the decade that we all know and love so much and yeah. get the hang, man. It is a pleasure dealing with Thank you, brother. Man. Thank you. It's a pleasure. <laughs> Bottom of my heart. And, and that's what I mean by he is the nicest guy in rock and roll. Everyone says this. We were backstage talking uh, at one of the shows with a band called O-Town. Yeah. And O-Town, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she, I do the same someone thing. Someone had a heart attack in the audience at the mention of O-Town. <laughs> I know. And you, She's we, having liquid we, dreams right now. <laughs> <laughs> Boom! Thank See what you. you did there. <laughs> And so we're watching you perform on the stage, and then one of the guys comes up, I think Jacob comes up, and is like, you know what, Mark, he is such the nicest guy. Just, but you were on stage performing, and he's telling me out of nowhere that how nice of a guy you are. Of course, I'm like, I know, isn't he unbelievably nice? You've got that reputation in the business, and that's a good thing to have. It's a great thing, and I've been called a lot worse than that, believe me, in this business. <laughs> and, you know, I've learned one thing. I'm not the most talented guy in the world. Yes, you are. Yeah, Donna earlier, Todd Bridges, yourself, some of the most talented people in the world have been on the stage tonight. I've listened, you know, it's mm -hmm. amazing. Uh, but I've learned if you shake some hands, remember some names, uh -huh. it'll take you far in the world. Yeah. That, no, no, seriously, I mean, I was up for a gig at Extra, uh -huh. and uh, one of the crew guys told me, he goes, you know what, you weren't even the first choice. You weren't even the top five. But you remembered everybody's names. Wow. And that puts you up to number one. So I felt good and bad at the same time. Uh -huh. You know, but uh, I just think, you know, say, I was just raised that way, and that's what I would do with my kids. Uh -huh. You know, it's, it's take, if you remember some names, have some decent manners in life, uh, it's still, chivalry is not dead yet, right. I don't think. You know, I think manners are important. So I'm doing my research on you, Mark. Yes. And everything is like, oh, sexiest man in rock and roll, sexiest man alive, sexiest man here and there. How does it feel to be a sex symbol, man? Because I'm trying to figure it out. Oh, listen to you. I'm trying to get on the ballot. Listen to you. He's like, a Q one and all for one. Uh, uh, but, but remember when, uh, what does it usually say when it says sexiest guy in rock and roll? Uh, not my name. Right, but it usually says 1998. Okay. You know what I mean? So let's qualify what it was. I had a really good year. 98, 99 was a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> it was fun, a lot of fun. But if you hang your hat on that, I wouldn't be talking to you right today. You know, we wrote some pretty good songs, and that's something I'm very proud of. And I'm, I'm the first guy to make fun of the band. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're hanging your hat and being like a sexy guy or this and that, I mean, you look at me now. I was talking to the guys in the band earlier. I uh, used to go on stage with my shirt off. <laughs> if I did that tonight, people would not come back and see me again. So <laughs> you learn very quickly, you know, that uh, wh how you sort of maintain longevity. I think Don was saying it best earlier. You have to, you know, sort of go out there and do different things and challenge uh -huh. yourself. And I think that's one thing that's kept me around, certainly kept you around. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, yeah, the, the sex thing was fun, but it goes <laughs> away. It goes away like a receding hairline, you know? Well, how, what is your criteria? You said you wrote a lot of hit songs. What is your criteria for a hit song? Because you clearly had the knack of figuring out what people wanted to hear. 
Well, it's funny when you say I wrote them, I wrote them with, with, with people. So okay. there was divine intervention involved. Um, a good melody and a great lyric has always been in vogue. Mm -hmm. You know, trends come and go, production comes and go, but a good lyric, something to touch people right down Broadway, yeah. right down the heart, that'll always be there. And the melody, too. You know, right. So uh, those two things are very important. All right, so right and a four part harmony like these guys have. These no. guys can sing anything. And I mean, you can sing the phone book. And you know, I'm like, oh, oh my God. I want someone to do that one time. You ever see that? I would say, you can sing anything. You can sing the phone book. I want to see a voice audition or something where they just step out and like, A, B, C, D. It's a good idea. The chairs turn around. You know, when it'd, they be, do that. it'd be a good uh, idea if they're talented or not. But this guy could do it all day. You got a beautiful voice. Well, thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. I love the 90s tour. One of the yeah. biggest tours of 2016 yeah. and 2017. So much fun. How are you enjoying the tour, man? What's been the best thing about it for you? You know what's been the best about it is the friendships again. Uh -huh. Seeing everybody again on stage and there's no pressure. Like, no one's up promoting a record. Uh -huh. And no one's like trying to hustle some sort of sales. It's like, if you love this great music of the 90s, yeah. Come see, we've got a lot of it for you. And uh, you know, the sets are like 10, 15 minutes long. It's uh -huh. great, you're sitting there and you, it's literally all hits. There's no, you, you yeah. know what I've never heard on the Isle of the 90s tour? What? Here's a new one. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I don't want to hear a new song, you know what I'm saying? What? Well, I shouldn't call out names. <laughs> well. <laughs> They're not on the tour anymore, but. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> They had like well, seven new ones, yeah. seven new ones. I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> well, the point is the spirit is what I'm trying to say, is that it's all there and we appreciate why we're there. We're there because we wrote some songs, they mean something to people, and we are happy. We sing them like it's the first time we ever perform them. Uh -huh. And I think that's what important, it's important. We have all of us collectively together. The changeovers are quick. You just get hit with all this 90s, yeah. you know, uh, uh, all these great hits of the 90s. And it's also uh, the uh, destination point. Like, people dress up as, TLC. Right. People dressed up as their favorite Friends character, and it's kind of become a 90s event. A more, a much less about the lineup, more about the decade. Yeah. You know, and it's fun to see all the, the married ladies, mid-40s out there drinking their wine coolers going, why am I so happy in my marriage? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and it kind of takes, or is that just me? Uh, it's kind of fun to see everybody get taken back to that time. Yeah. That transports people, and that's what, that's what music does, you know? Being part, once you have number one songs, once you've written a couple, uh, you still couple records, you're part of people's life's landscapes. Yeah. Whether you're Los Del Rio with, hey, hey Macarena, yeah. you know, it's like, it, some people come up to me and say, Fly was the first song my kid ever sang. Um, every morning I got was in the background when I got engaged. Uh -huh. These become property of people. Yeah. Right? These were their life's they moments. They themselves the emotion. Yeah, you know them. Your yeah. songs, are, like, well, I don't want to know what your songs have done to people and, uh, and how many times people have procreated <laughs> and how many people your songs have created. Um, but you know what I mean? Once you touch that special place, um, <laughs> you are forever uh, indebted. You will forever be able to have a career, I believe. Yeah, so you had the music career, but you also had the hosting and everything else. What was it, or at what point did you say to yourself, I need to diversify and add hosting or radio DJ onto my list to stay that relevant sort of person? When a man named Sean Fanning came up with Napster. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and you're like, well, boy, that record only sold 750,000 copies. Yeah. Almost one platinum. We'll get him next time. All of a sudden, six weeks later, yeah. music is free. Yeah. It is free. So the streamlining, online kind of thing came into play, where if you told a band in the 80s or 70s, listen, you're going to six, sell six, seven million records, you would have mm -hmm. said, okay, we're pretty good. At this is going to be our career. Right. Where overnight, uh, industry kind of disappeared. Yeah. Um, it, like, it's kind of akin to like telling a dentist or something, hey, um, you know, we're no, no longer using drills anymore, we're using this, but you can't use the new technology. You know what I mean? It's right. like, the industry just imploded. So I think that it was at a point where, uh, and it was also a perfect storm. A couple guys in our band wanted to have kids and kind of mm -hmm. raise them and, and be home and not be in the cycle of uh, releasing a record and going on tour. So I just returned some calls, yeah. literally, Delia. So it was on, uh, on, on, the, on the list, and one of them was the extra. And I said, listen, you want to come down for a meeting? Kind of what you did to me tonight. He, he goes to me, uh, hey, Mark, I do a little podcast. We talk about music. It's no big whoop. I'm like, you want to come down? I go, sure. I get here. It's like a stage, a setup, a band. It's a performance. There's cameras. I'm like, what is going on? So they kind of bamboozled me. You know what I'm saying? Oops. And I, and I, <laughs> 
<laughs> and I couldn't be happy to be here, by the way. And so I kind of took a meeting not knowing what I was getting into. Uh -huh. uh, and literally, I took this meeting on a Friday just as a, hello, how are you? What do you want to do? And uh, two weeks later, I was hosting the entertainment news program, which uh -huh. is extra. Uh -huh. And I had to learn in front of people. Right. Because, you know, on stage, stage is big, gigantic moves. You're trying to play to the last row in the audience. And I'm kind of a spaz, as you can tell. I may say things before I should, and I'm a, you know, a stream of consciousness kind of thinker. On, on and TV, everything's subtle. Yeah. And so, like, you know, like Clint Eastwood made a career raising an eyebrow, you know? <laughs> so, like, TV is very subtle. It picks everything up. And so I had to learn to slow it down, right. talk a little bit slower. Right. And I remember six months into my first, uh, my, my tenure there at Extra, I was walking to a 7-Eleven. And it was about six in the morning, and this guy with the big neck tattoo, <laughs> giant neck tattoo, I'm going to get coffee. He'd obviously been up all night. Um, I walk in, and, and I go, oh, God, this guy's going gonna to just tear me apart. He's going to beat me up. He just had that look in his eye. He goes, hey, dude. I go, what? He goes, you sucked when you started. But you're getting better at extra. Wow. Keep it up. <laughs> so it's like, wow. <laughs> To me, it was the biggest compliment in the world because he, he was right. I did suck. I was so spastic and, and crazy, and I kind of had to learn in front of America. So uh -huh. that was the whole kind of extra trip. And I, I was there for four years, a uh -huh. lot of fun. Um, asking Al Pacino what he thinks about Kevin and Brittany breaking up <laughs> steals a little bit of your soul. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that was difficult. I actually did that to him. I go, you know, I did the whole, you know, hey, you talk about the movies, but then you know what people at Extra, the viewers, want to see. Uh -huh. So I go, hey, Al, I got to ask you. It's a recent events, and you know, we're Extra. Um, you know, Kevin and Brittany just broke up, man. What are your thoughts? He, he looks at me, he goes, he goes, you're better than that. <laughs> I just walked away, and I go, ah! And so, uh, you know, there was moments like that that I, that I do remember. But I, at the end of the day, they put a show on every day. You walk in at 6 a.m. and there's no show. Mm -hmm. And five hours later, there's a show they send up to the satellite. So it was some of the most hardworking people I've ever met in my life. Yeah. I learned so much. And I've got a, a set of uh, skills in my back pocket called TV hosting when I can bring it out every now and then. What was your worst interview? I, it was actually my worst and best at the same time. Uh -huh. It was Brian Wilson from uh, the Beach, Beach Boys. Boys. Yeah, one of my all-time favorites, written some of the classics, and I, I was just so enamored of this man. And Brian's a little n notoriously difficult. You know, he's- I uh, didn't know that. Well, he's, he's, he's not in a mean way, he just he's on his own planet. Uh -huh. He's a genius, you know, which geniuses are uh, able, they have, you know, they've got a long leash, they can do what they want as far as I'm concerned, especially when you've written the catalog that the Beach Boys have. So I was told I had five minutes with him, and uh, Brian Wilson gets down, he sits at a piano because he'll only do interviews sitting at his piano, that's where he feels comfortable. Mm. So he starts playing God Only Knows, which is one of my all-time favorite songs by the Beach Boys, one of the most beautiful songs ever. He's about two minutes into it, and I've got a five-minute interview. So I go, I've got to interrupt Brian Wilson right now playing one of the best songs ever written. And Don't so he's, it, he's getting to the, no, yeah, right. Well, what do you think I did, Delius? Uh, I get, he gets to the bridge, and I'm like, uh, hey, Brian, uh, God Only Knows, one of my favorite songs of all time. He goes, food, got up and left. Wow. And that was my interview with Brian Wilson, which, by the way, was the greatest thing in the world for me personally. I'm like, of course I wanted that moment, but uh -huh. didn't really play that well on Extra that day. Holy crap. Yeah. That, that would have crushed me. Well, you get a thick skin. Oh, yeah. Least you do when you're in that business. And, you know, you're on the red carpet. People pass you by. You're shouting things out. You have these Al Pacino moments like I was talking about. And, uh, you know, these guys work hard. Mario Lopez is one of the best in the business. Uh, these guys are really good at what they do. You know, it kind of gets thrown away as kind of perfunctory. And, you know, what the entertainment news is for fun. But these are some of the most hardworking people I've ever met in my life. Yeah. And I'm talking behind the scenes, making things happen, uh, turning stories on the dime. You know, uh, big news would break 10 minutes before we're going to send this, uh, the show up to the satellite. They'd have to re, you know, uh, redo the show, and uh, I learned a lot. I learned what hard work was like at that, at that show. I remember my, my caveat was, uh, so I've got to be here every day, huh? Mm. Now, mind you, I'm coming from the rock and roll world, so I'm like Monday through Friday, show up on nine to nine. <laughs> Mornings, yeah. give it a shot. Yeah, you know what I mean? Because that, yeah, it wasn't my track record in the '90s, believe me. <laughs> All right, one question before we go, go to a game here. When I say to you, Sharknado Two, what do you think? <laughs> what do you think of Sharknado Two? I think of me being robbed. You for get... an Emmy that year. Oh, yeah, yes. I really, really do. You know, I mean, it's pretty simple. I played Martin, who was uh, Finn's uh, best friend. Finn is Ian, not Ian, Ian Ziering's uh -huh. character in Sharknado. And the interesting thing about Sharknado, a little bit of fun factoids if you uh, Sharknado fans, is I originally was offered the role of Finn in Sharknado 
one. Oh, no. Yes, indeed. Um, it was too good for you then, huh? Wait, you know, you know what's funny about it? I looked at the amount of work and acting in it, and I said, I can't do that. Right. No, really, I go, there's too much acting in it, because, like, this Finn character was going to obviously uh, take, you know, carry the whole movie. And uh, Ian Ziering is so committed to the role that it only works because of him. Now, they make a million of these, like, octopus versus shark movies, and they make a mm -hmm. zillion of them, but none of them had the culture impact that Sharknado right. has, and it's because of Ian Ziering. And I remember my first day on set at Sharknado, I went to go meet Ian and say hello, and, hey, I'm your best friend, let's, you know, let's run some lines, or whatever actors do, I don't know. Uh, and I was about to knock on his trailer, and I hear this, Aah! coming from the trailer, and then, Aah! And I look at this production assistant, and this person must be writing comedy right now, this PA. He looks at me and goes, dead eye, and goes, I think he's getting into character. And I went. <laughs> <laughs> so I back down the steps. I go, I think I'll meet him later. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think I'll meet him a little later. So he took that thing seriously. He never broke the wall and said, we're not, we're not make, we are making Lethal Weapon. You know what I mean? We are, I am John McClane, reporting for duty, sir. We are making Die Hard. You know? well, I guess some people read scripts differently, huh? Yeah, well, yeah definitely. <laughs> if you read Sharknado 2 script and you thought you were making Die Hard. Yeah, right, exactly. Well, and listen, they're making number six, seven, and eight. And, uh, you and know, they're making a killing off of it. This yeah. has like become this franchise that's, that's making a killing a lot of money. The man has his own uh, chainsaws now, I'm Zerin. He has his own chainsaws. He has his own chainsaws. That's all I have to say. <laughs> See, you, you can't look a gift, uh, gift horse in the mouth because you, you never know what's going to bring you back that, and what's going to get you, you know paid what? later on. I right? heard you talking about earlier, but this entertainment business, you've got to survive the ebb and flow. Yeah. You know, if you've ever been lucky enough to have any sort of success, man, I mean, just be so happy, be there, present in the moment, enjoy every beat of it because yep. everybody does this. And those people that can ride that stay. Those people can't, yeah. don't. Because I, you know, I can barely sing, you know that. I can barely act, Sharknado 2, you can just watch that. But... I'm still here. Yes. You know, and I'm not going anywhere. Yeah. I'm not giving you back my. I'm yeah. not giving you back my uniform. Good. This H and M sure to stand on me. Huh? <laughs> right. You know what I'm saying? H and M <laughs> and Zara. <laughs> hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Mark McGrath from the band Sugar A. You're watching Flashback tonight. You gotta subscribe. This is my man Delius Kennedy. Come on now.